Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Egina Francis Makwabe. I'm the uh, medical chief medical director of Africa Healthcare Network. I'm the physician and consultant nephrologist working in Tanzania. So I would, I would like to welcome you all for today's uh, AHN Nephrology Education Webinar and today's series number 54. Um, uh, today's topic is sustainable development goal relevant to kidney health. And um, it is a great honor to introduce to you uh, our today's speaker, who is uh, Dr. Varari uh, Raksi, uh, who is a nephrologist, uh, Children's Hospital in Zurich, and also a nephrologist, Kant uh, Hospital, Ru Bendran, Charles, Switzerland. Um, she's an associate pro lecturer, uh, Reno Division, uh, Brangham and Women Hospital, and a honorary associate professor in pediatrics and children's health, University of Cape, Cape Town, South Africa. She's a deputy chair, advocates working group, International Society of Nephrology, and she's uh, American, uh, American board certified in internal medicine and nephrology. So, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Varari, you are warmly welcome uh, to talk and go through uh, the Millennium Development. No, it's not Millennium, it's Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, that's keep on, keep on confusing me, Millennium and Sustainable. Uh, you'll probably explain it during your presentation. You're warmly welcome, Dr. Varari. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really a massive honor to be asked. I'm going to try and share my screen now quickly. So I really appreciate this opportunity. And I think it's more actually, you know, hopefully that we can discuss afterwards because I think this is definitely not a topic that is specifically mine. I think it's a topic we all kind of share. Um, and I'm sure everyone has had thoughts and experiences and you might be doing a lot of this in your own instinctive sort of practice every day. So just briefly, I don't have any financial disclosures. I do work a lot with the ISN, which is where I sort of got in, involved with a lot of this uh, through the advocacy committee. And just from personal experience, I'm very passionate about improving equitable access to care and uh, health for kidney disease. So just a brief overview, I'll discuss the origin of SDGs, why they're important for kidney health, focus then a little bit on SDG 3, which is the one SDG that's focusing specifically on good health and well-being, and then just discuss a few other examples on how other SDGs may impact kidney health and kidney care, and then I think the biggest message is really the need for a holistic approach. So as mentioned, the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals get a bit mixed up. The Millennium Development Goals actually originated in 2001, or at least were, were launched uh, in 2001 by the United Nations, and they went through until 2015. And there were eight Millennium Development Goals, and these basically are the eight. And if you look specifically, there were three that had impact directly on health. The others all indirectly impact health, but the plan was to reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, and combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, which also included TB. And interestingly, uh, this number six, largely the focus was HIV, AIDS, but people thought it would not be acceptable to just go after one disease, and so that's why they enhanced that to malaria and TB. So for a good 15 years, all countries were signed up to these MDGs and they were trying to achieve the MDGs. A lot of development aid was put into this and countries were actually requested to report on their progress. So there was a huge amount of focus on these three MDGs from the health perspective. From our perspective, from the kidney world, even though kidney disease wasn't necessarily included there, there was progress. And this is from the Millennium Development Goals report in 2015, when the MDGs actually moved over and was replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'll discuss in a little while. But just to show you that by 2015, and unfortunately, some of these gains have been lost now with COVID, but there were a lot more people who had access to drinking water, a lot more people on ART for HIV, a lot more people sleeping under bed nets, more women going to antenatal uh, care and having attended births attended by skilled health per, uh, personnel. 
the global extreme poverty reduced and the number of children enrolled in schools increased more access to mobile phones and so there were despite the fact that the mdgs were not specifically directed even to chronic diseases never mind kidney disease i think if we are objective from the kidney side we could say well even if we were ignored to some degree we likely benefited but what we learned from these MDGs, interestingly, is because they were now official targets, global health assistance increased from 12 billion in 2001 to 36 billion in 2013. So having the targets was good and attracted money. What we saw, because I've just shown you there has been benefit, what gets measured gets done. So countries were focusing on showing an improvement in maternal uh, deaths, for example. So they were measuring that and with the target, it got done. There were increased aid flows, but what was concerning is not much policy change. And unfortunately, a lot of the money went to very vertical programs, meaning programs only dealing with malaria or only dealing with maternal health. So little parachute programs in the health system, not in integrated and a lot of this did not lead to policy change. Also there was accelerated progress very unequally across the globe so a lot of places were left behind and some countries definitely were still lagging. The targets were imposed from the outside and so each country had to now show that they were improving child mortality or maternal health but those may not have been critically important priority conditions for certain countries. So this was a problem is that countries were all almost forced in a way to meet those targets even and sometimes ignoring or having not the money to focus on more important problems and what was very important from our perspective for non-communicable diseases is that spending was actually lower in the late 2000s than in the 1990s and this is just because there was probably diversion of money away from NCDs towards these target goals of the MDGs. So this study came out in 2017. I really think it illustrates extremely well what I've been trying to say. You can, we know now, and this has been since the early 2000s, that non-communicable diseases have actually been the leading, leading causes of deaths and disease burden globally. So you can see non-communicable diseases around the world contribute to over 70% of deaths, for example. But what has happened in terms of funding since 2000 is that only 2% of the development aid funding to low and middle income countries has gone towards NCDs. Most of it has gone to HIV, quite a lot to maternal health. But as you can see, there's a huge disproportion between where the money went and where the money may actually be needed. And so this was a big problem imposed by the Millennium Development Goals. And this is just from 2019 to show you what we all know is that non-communicable diseases are actually now the leading causes of death. And this has been, as I said, since the early 2000s, just to give you a perspective, chronic kidney disease is similar to diabetes. Cardiovascular disease, cancers, respiratory disease, and diabetes have always been considered the four very important non-communicable diseases. Uh, but just to show that kidney disease is important, the problem with kidney disease is we don't have much data because there's not great access to diagnosis in many places. And actually, there have been extrapolations over the last couple of years. We know, for example, that as many people die directly of kidney disease as die of cardiovascular disease due to chronic kidney disease. We know, we think that probably around 1.7 million people a year might die of acute kidney injury. And then there was a publication in 2015 that said maybe between two and seven million people die around the world every year because they don't have access to dialysis. So basically it's possible that chronic kidney disease or kidney disease may actually lead to a lot more deaths than are currently appreciated. And this is something that we as the kidney community need to start improving and gathering data about. And so as you all know, Initially, the WHO, when they realized that non-communicable diseases were actually the leading killers, focused on cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cancer, and diabetes. And then in the last few years, they've actually added mental health and they've focused on risk factors, all reducing cardiovascular disease and pollution. Again, from the kidney perspective, kidney disease is somewhat neglected, is not specifically named, but what I try always to emphasize is whatever is good for the heart, the brain and diabetes is good for kidneys. And so I do think that even though we're not specifically mentioned, we are benefiting from these programs. Just to show you as well that the prevalence may be a little bit different to the mortality 
Globally, CKD is quite prevalent, potentially more prevalent than cardiovascular disease, but this also just includes people with uh, microalbuminuria. It also does not include patients with acute kidney injury. And so recently you might have seen that there is an estimate that maybe 850 million people around the world have some form of chronic kidney disease. So this is just to show that kidney disease is important. Kidney dysfunction is actually the eighth leading risk factor for death around the world. And if you can see, it's really the main organ system that seems to be included in this list. But there are many other risk factors, and a lot of these, as we'll go into a little bit later, all contribute to kidney dysfunction. And as we know, just coming back to this idea that we need broader attention than just to the Millennium Development Goals, this is a spectrum of risk factors for acute kidney injury. And as you can see, goes, as we all know and we see every day, goes from the individual patient all the way through to the environment, geography, we've seen earthquakes causing acute kidney injury, and then we have patients on very sophisticated medicine for, let's say, cancer that get acute kidney injury. So enormous breadth of risk factors. We know as well, for example, and this was a very nice publication on CKD and pregnancy in Africa, that there are so many other factors besides just the lady's health, her own pregnancy, um, which impact the outcome of her pregnancy. And some of this is transport to the clinic, lack of a clinic, maybe lack of knowledge of her own knowledge or that of healthcare workers, that she's too poor to attend the antenatal clinic, etc. And then similarly also, and this uh, graph was developed by Arpana Iyengar from Bangalore, we can see that when we think of kidney health in children also is impacted by so many different things, the health of their parents, where they go to school, what they're able to eat, what their birth circumstances were, etc. So kidney disease is definitely, as we know, impacted by many, many things more than just simply health. And so this brings us now to the Sustainable Development Goals, which were launched in 2015 by the United Nations. And these are actually 17 goals. These were to replace the Millennium Development Goals because there was a recognition that the Millennium Development Goals were relatively limited and too focused. And as you can see here, there's only one of the SDGs, this SDG number three, that's focused directly on health. But my argument, and I think increasingly everyone's argument, also COVID has shown us this very starkly, that every single one of these SDGs impacts health. Health also in turn impacts all the others because healthy people can work, can contribute to the environment, etc. Whereas unhealthy people maybe drains on the environment, for example, but also equity, education, nutrition, economic growth, uh, climate, etc., all impact health and impact kidney disease. So this is an example uh, of a systematic review that several colleagues did on the outcomes of kidney disease in sub-Saharan Africa. The aim here was just to show that people who do not have access to dialysis have very, very poor outcomes. And the mortality is enormous for end-stage kidney disease. And the mortality is very high for acute kidney injury when people don't get access to dialysis. And we came up with this idea of delays in the MDGs, in trying to improve maternal health, they had this idea of three delays, why women are not getting, uh, uh, why women are dying, that there's a delay in diagnosis, delay in access to healthcare, and then a delay in good quality healthcare. And so we came up with various delays, why people with end stage or acute kidney injury may die. So the first delay is poor access to diagnosis or to primary health care. The second delay is people have to look for resources. Then some may go to traditional remedies and this may delay then presentation to a health system, a health center where a person may actually get an appropriate diagnosis. Even if they're diagnosed, sometimes they may need to be transferred to a center where dialysis is available. And I'm sure a lot of you experience this every day. And then we thought, how do the SDGs really impact this? And so what we can see is that in terms of the risk of renal failure, this is multifactorial. Uh, we know, for example, that acute kidney injury is more community acquired in Africa than in North America, for example. And that's related to a lot of things like clean water, equity, climate, etc. Then there is the delay in terms of access to primary health care. Again, a lot of inequality infrastructure which can impact that. There are delays in terms of who is going to be 
getting access to health. Families yeah. sometimes decide not to pay for care for women. They may, may decide, sorry, then there's reliance on traditional remedies, partly because people believe they work, but also partly because they're more accessible or cheaper and people are desperate. And then there is delay, even once people get to a hospital where dialysis might be available, there's a lot of infrastructural problems, which are again related to multiple of the SDGs. So I've just run through this quite quickly, but just to give an example that there is a lot more than just a person getting kidney disease and may survive or die if they get dialysis. There's an enormous amount of environmental and circumstantial things that contribute to that outcome. So now just briefly to start with the most obvious one of the SDGs, and I'm not going to go through all 17, I think each of you can come up with very good examples to yourselves how each one of the 17 SDGs may impact kidney health, but just to go a little bit on good health and well being which is SDG number three. And here the goal is to ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all at all ages. And this website of the Sustainable Development Goals has all these materials that one can freely download. And this is just an infographic, for example. And it just shows here that um, less than half of the global population is covered by essential health services, for example. When we're thinking from the kidney health point of view, we want people with risk factors to be detected. So risk factors like hypertension can be treated early and maybe the person doesn't need to get kidney disease or a lady needs to get access to good antenatal coverage or a child needs to get access to vaccination. So this is very concerning that less than half of the global population is covered by essential health services. There are many other um, inequities in terms of health and I invite you all to look at this website and look at all these infographics. These are the sub targets, or at least some of them of this SDG three, which is about good health and well-being. So one of them remains the same as the maternal, as the MDG, reducing maternal mortality. The MDG as well was ending all preventable deaths, and the MDG was also fighting communicable diseases like HIV, malaria, etc. So these three at the top are essentially continuing the work of the Millennium Development Goals, which as I showed you was successful. But there are various new additions, reducing accidents, preventing substance abuse, reducing illness and death from hazardous chemicals and pollution, making sure that women have access to family planning and reproductive care, etc. These all are targets which countries have to monitor and have to try to achieve. And the value of having all these targets is that countries should be setting up health information systems. They should be able to track progress in the health system, track progress on these SDGs, in the other sectors like transport, education, its environment. The government should also be tracking the progress of all these SDGs. And this may hopefully allow governments to then identify where are we not progressing well? Where do I need to put my resources? But just to continue with health, from our perspective, again, from the kidney world, target 3.4 is one of the more relevant ones. And the target here is to reduce mortality from non-communicable diseases and promote mental health. And the, the target there was to reduce mortality by 30% by 2030. So what is very key is very often we think, yes, we want to provide health services, but this is a very interesting study that I think really is relevant here, because what we know is that almost 16 million people in 2016 died of, there were excess deaths from low, in low and middle income countries. This means people who didn't necessarily need to die, but they, they died. 8.6 million of these were because were amenable to healthcare, meaning that 8.6 million of these 15.6 million deaths could have been preventable if people had gotten the proper health care. And of those 8.6, 5 million actually died of poor quality care, meaning they actually got to the clinic, they got to the hospital, but they were not treated properly. And 3.6 million died because they never got to the clinic. And if we look at cardiovascular disease, for example, that's the leading cause of death again, but we can see here in blue that the majority of the cardiovascular deaths in these LMICs in 2016 were actually due to poor quality care, not so much that the person wasn't getting there. So this is something that is emerging is that when we deliver care, we need to make sure that the quality is good. We need also to integrate care and here again, all these diseases inter, uh, integrate, interrelate with each other. They interrelate with TB, malaria and HIV 
and with a lot of risk factors. And so this is really what the SDG is trying to emphasize. There's all this, we need a holistic approach because all of these interact with each other to impact the outcomes in our patients. So health financing for the workforce, education, and obviously support is critical. We know, for example, in Malawi that um, there was a workshop and a lot of people mentioned they had never really had teaching about acute kidney injury. But when you look at it, most people are actually trying to manage patients with acute kidney injury. So we need to identify these gaps and we need to now start training and improving knowledge, for example, in this case, about acute kidney injury. We also need to improve people's confidence. The patients are not stupid and when they realize the quality is not good, they don't come. And so we need to improve that and this is globally. And then for example, task shifting and using more community workers as they're doing successfully in India, for example, where community health workers have iPads, they have risk scores and they communicate with family doctors on how to manage patients will actually bring healthcare to people. And this is again, innovation technology, fits with a lot of the other SDGs beyond health. And then supporting research and development is again part of the SDG for health, but intersects with a lot of other SDGs, including um, infrastructure, innovation, energy, et cetera. And for example, we can learn a lot from traditional remedies. We maybe need more research there, but also more research on why people are using them and how they might be harmful. Dialysis needs a huge amount of innovation. I don't need to tell you that it's massively expensive and there's an estimate, estimated market of 127 billion by 2024 worldwide. And this is in a handful of countries where it's paid for by tax and insurance. People paying out of pocket cannot pay these numbers. So we need as a kidney world to start pushing for a COVAX for dialysis. And then now to go on to a couple of examples of the other SDGs. So poverty obviously impacts kidney disease import, uh, very much. SDG one is the goal to end poverty in all its forms everywhere by 2030. But unfortunately now, especially since COVID, there's been the first increase in global poverty over decades. So there had been progress, we're losing this progress. We need to remember, we need to continue to try to fight this and achieve SDG one. And SDG1, as Gloria Ashintantang mentioned when she gave this talk in Australia at the WCN, poverty, poverty, poverty is one of the bottom lines of chronic kidney disease management in Africa. Also in North America and in even high income countries, we know that the social determinants of health are major out, uh, predictors of progression and outcomes of chronic kidney disease. And here again, this is poverty. What is interesting here is this is a study from Ghana that looked at asset ownership because this is almost the opposite of poverty. And here you could see that the, there was more overweight and obesity in people who owned all sorts of things like cars, DVDs, TVs. Interestingly, owning a washing machine doesn't seem to be a risk factor. But the bottom line here really is that we also need to be careful that when there may be improvements in poverty, people don't become overweight and obese. They also learn how to make choices for lifestyles when they can suddenly access a lot more than they did before. And then we've all heard of catastrophic health expenditure. This means that families are spending money on health that they cannot spend on other things and may push them into poverty. This is a study from India where it's showing there's a very high percentage of patients experience catastrophic health expenditure when they need dialysis, even in the government subsidized dialysis, because in Brown, there are a lot of indirect costs that are not dialysis specific, like transport, loss of work, et cetera, that lead to catastrophic health expenditure. So when we think about how do we support these patients, we have to think we need to support them, transport, work, et cetera. These are SDGs. SDGs is efficiency of public transport, safe and dignified work, et cetera. So again, here, other SDGs, in addition to just health, will impact the lives of these patients and their families. And then the big question of uni universal health coverage. We all know that universal health coverage is really trying to include everybody with all diseases under the national health insurance or some sort of a, a covered um, financing. The pooled funds of a country are in blue. The enormous demands of the entire health of the population are in white. The idea would be that the blue box is the same size as the white box, but it almost never is. And so governments really need to try to understand what do they actually manage to put in this blue box. 
Hopefully the blue box will increase over time, but governments need to decide which services should we cover first, which population should we cover first, and then obviously if they're not covering, how much should people have to pay out of pocket? So universal health, health coverage requires this idea of priority setting, and Lloyd had just mentioned this to me, so I just quickly put these two slides in. This is from a WHO um, work uh, working document as well as various publications by the same group. And this just really shows that if you had $100,000 to spend, you could actually save the lives of a few people by treating hypertension. Whereas if you decided to vaccinate children against malaria, or meningitis, for example, you would actually avert a lot of cases, you would save a lot of deaths. But the question is, should we put all our money into now vaccinating children and ignore all the people with hypertension? Or should we treat all the people with hypertension and not vaccinate? The countries obviously cannot make these decisions and they try to make these decisions. They should know how many people have hypertension, how many children are dying of meningitis and try to decide what is the burden of disease what are the other impacts and then somehow decide how to prioritize and how to allocate health resources. This is an example about dialysis, for example, in Kenya. And this analysis said that basically treating and diagnosing TB definitely cost effective, traffic safety regulations sort of cost effective, Met treatment of asthma not that cost effective, and then dialysis is way off the charts if you're thinking about cost effectiveness. The problem is that without dialysis people die, and so countries sometimes decide to provide dialysis on a limited scale just because people are dying even if it's very not cost effective. So this is just a small dabble into priority setting that just shows you how complicated these decisions are that governments have to decide. Do I try to treat cheap diseases that are affecting a lot of people but then I ignore people dying with expensive diseases. So this is an enormous problem and we're all living this in nephrology every day. So the question is, is universal health coverage possible for kidney disease? Should we be expanding priority services? I showed you that kidney disease is highly prevalent and deaths might be a lot more than we know. The bottom line is we as the kidney community need to start contributing good, reliable data from everywhere so that governments locally can be informed. What is the kidney disease burden? Then when governments or if they decide to treat, who should they treat? Some countries are treating only AKI with dialysis, others only ESKD. Do we treat only adults or children? Do we try only to prevent kidney disease? Do we try to treat kidney disease before it gets to dialysis? So this is a huge problem. If we want to manage kidney disease, who do we treat and what degree of kidney disease are we going to treat? And who are we going to choose if we have only limited dialysis slots, for example? And then the big argument, especially for dialysis, is how do we sustain this and finance this sustainably? And then, as I mentioned already, quality of care has to come into this. And I just heard from Lloyd that as you're expanding, you are doing quality assessment. And I think that is absolutely critical because the patients deserve that. Level of clean water to ensure access to safe water and sanitation for all we know. Water is a big problem. There are still billions of people who lack water and sanitation worldwide. From our perspective, we all think diarrhea is a big cause of acute kidney injury. We don't know how many people die of AKI from diarrhea worldwide. It would be great to be able to know this number. And we know that if we improve sanitation, improve hygiene and routinely vaccinate children, we can actually gain a huge return on investment. So here, we would also anticipate a lot less AKI and less deaths from AKI. There's an interesting study that was done uh, several years ago about children with gastroenteritis, with moderate to severe gastroenteritis in Africa and Southeast Asia, just as an illustration about what we don't know. We know that children with severe gastroenteritis had a higher mortality. What was interesting is a third died within seven days in hospital. You can imagine these are the children with a very severe disease. But interestingly, a third then died within the first three weeks. And a third still died after three weeks. This was at home. And my big question is, could some of these delayed deaths have been due to AKI? We don't know this. So we need to start collecting data. Gender equality is very key. We know that this is a big problem worldwide. And we know as well that there have been some gains, but there are still a lot of inequities. And again, some of these worsened by COVID. 
And this is just a great paper by Ifeoma Ulasi from Nigeria. This is already quite old, but it's really interesting. She looked at patients admitted that were looked after by the renal service, those admitted dialyzed who received optimal dialysis, received a permanent vascular access, and those who received a kidney transplant. And when you look at the sex ratio, as the treatment got more expensive, sorry, uh, the ratio of men to women went up. So this shows that there seems to be some favoring of men in the treatment, at least the advanced kidney disease. And then peace, justice, and strong institutions are necessary. We want good governance, not only of the health system, good stewardship of the health system, but we need a multi-sectoral approach if we are to uh, achieve all the SDGs. We need laws, we need uh, collaboration between ministries of transport and education and health and environment, etc. And so this is extremely important. And in a recent paper on the SDGs and kidney, which is freely accessible and um, open access, we tried to just come up with an example. This is from South Africa of indicators. So we tried to look at every single SDG and how South Africa is progressing on these. And red means they're not doing well. They might be sliding backwards. Green means they're well on track to achieving the target by 2030. And we thought that this would be an interesting idea from the kidney community to try to look at this in various countries to stimulate the government to say, we're having this big kidney problem, we need more girls accessing primary care, for example, because we know that when young girls are educated, they get pregnant later, their children are healthier, uh, their families are healthier, they themselves are healthier as an example. So this, we can't read it, it's tiny, but just an idea that the SDGs with the measurements that countries are doing and reporting can actually help countries to identify where do I need to put more money and more time into these red areas so that the health of everybody can improve. And so now just in conclusion, in terms of the SDGs and kidney health, the bottom line is, I think the biggest thing is they can all help to prevent kidney disease. So we know, for example, that there is this idea of developmental programming. When children are born low birth weight, high birth weight, preterm, they have a higher risk of kidney disease. There are lots of SDGs that go into healthy mothers and healthy babies, as well as SDG 3, where access to good antenatal care is important. And women with preeclampsia, are, they're screened for preeclampsia, screened for diabetes. These are managed appropriately and early. We know then that when these children are born, they grow up to be teenagers. There's a lot of risk factors they may have in growing up. Again, various SDGs involved. Childhood obesity is a big problem. Childhood pregnancy is a big problem, for example. These can increase the risk of kidney disease in these children and these women, as well as needing access to basic healthcare in children to keep children healthy, keep them in school, and then prevent them from developing bad habits, which can impact their kidney function later in life. And then as teenagers become young adults, equity is huge. We know from uh, Mesoamerica that there are these young men that are dying of end-stage kidney disease, the CKDU. We know that diabetes in certain countries is a huge epidemic in the young. Again, various SDGs can impact this as well as the health system. We need access to good health education, universal health care, prevention programs, plus children and teenagers who get good education can then become healthcare workers and maybe retained as healthcare workers. And then finally, as young adults get older, we know that everybody's getting a little bit larger as we get older. Again, a lot of SDGs impact this working and aging part of life, as well as access to good care so that people can be screened, can be detected and diagnosed early and kidney disease can then be prevented. So finally, the goals of the SDGs are this integration of people, prosperity, peace, partnership, and the planet. All these five factors are critical if we are all to be healthy people living on a healthy planet, which is the goal of the SDGs. And this requires multi-sectoral action. The health sector needs to interact with others and they need to interact with us. Just to remind you, as one of the last slides, this 
difference between equality and equity. Equity is what we should strive for. And equity would be in a really good health system when we can realize that we can provide more to people who may need more because everybody actually has enough. And this would be really the dream and the goal of an equitable health system so that some people are not left behind even though they're getting the same as everybody else. We need to have systems that are equitable, meaning meeting the needs of everybody so that everyone has an equal opportunity in this case to watch the sports game. So finally, the world is coming around to this idea. This is an example of Build Back Better. Everybody's realized with COVID that there is a huge problem. The world is partly in this mess because we haven't paid attention to all the SDGs. And so there are a lot more now collaborative uh, works that are coming out with the WHO, the U United Nations, et cetera, focusing on using the SDGs as targets to improve health and life in general. So thank you very much for listening. I will stop there. Um, if anyone is interested, there are some references that uh, briefly discuss all the SDGs. I'm happy to share these. They are uh, also open access. Um, and I'll stop screening now and uh, sharing now and hopefully we can have a bit of a discussion. Thank you for listening. Wow. <clears throat> thank you, Valerie. That was an uh, excellent talk and presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so it's it's um it's a time for questions and answers uh, or comments. Uh, but uh, let me start uh, by saying, uh, Valerie, I like the SDGs uh, because you know it helps the government to concentrate and plan uh, for these goals that you know have been put by WHO and 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 of course uh, World Health Organization. I mean uh, United Nations. So that is very good. But the problem is uh, putting uh, all of them together, like SDG number three, uh, which is um, good health and well-being. That is SDG number three. So there you could you put re reduction of maternal mortality, you could reduce uh, mortality in uh, children under five years, um, HIV AIDS. So you, you, you will find that in, in Africa, where you know, as you mentioned, poverty is you know is very very high. Uh, people will concentrate on those goals that will bring money into uh, into the country, and therefore create employment. But those uh, issues that doesn't bring money won't get anything per se. And that's where it now comes uh, the NCDs, which are also included in this uh, you know uh, SDG number uh, number three. So you will find that there will be uh, less concentration on prevention of uh, non-communicable diseases. And, and uh, as I said, I was going through, uh, through your article that was published in the research gate. And I read that article and uh, this is a quote that, you know, uh, excited me. Uh, you wrote it, but you, you quoted it from um, uh, that It is globalization was purported to be the rising tide that would lift all boats. But the reality is it lifted the big one and sank the small boats. So now this is due to globalization. And I don't know if what we're experiencing in Africa is what the big countries are experiencing. So uh, that is my comment. Maybe if you have anything to add on that, I'll be happy. I think it's a fantastic comment and I think that's the reality and I think this is what I'm very disappointed, especially for example with this COVID vaccinations. Everybody knows that we should be sharing vaccinations and they're not sharing vaccinations, you know, so I think um, the problem really is people are now aware of this, but how to make it a reality. And I think that's exactly what you said. Until now, there's really been a huge amount of money for malaria, HIV, TB. Part of the reason for that um, is probably that these infections are so much easier to measure. You know, you know that someone hasn't died of malaria within two weeks. You know someone hasn't died of, you know, end-stage kidney disease within 20 years. So a lot of the donors want to show that they're being effective. Plus, everyone has this idea that everybody is dying in the poor countries of infections. Infections are important. I think COVID also has shown us infections, Ebola is showing us infections are critical. We can't stop looking after the infections, but we need more money 
to go into non-communicable diseases. And I think this is where for me, the SDGs are attractive because they do have the capacity to prevent NCDs. I think if, you know, if, if we stop, um, you know, if we try to improve climate change or we try to prevent obesity by making people walk, have safe environments where they can walk, you know, they don't have to catch the bus or, um, you know, giving them better options in terms of what food they can afford. I think there, the NCDs, what has been, there's actually a brilliant paper called Saving Lives, Spending Less. If you put that into the into Google, you'll come up with this free document from the WHO. And it shows that for every $1 that we spend now on prevention, the government generates many dollars by 2030 in terms of savings, because they're preventing non-communicable diseases and they're saving lives and improving economic productivity. So, you know, I think it's very hard, but that's where we need also the economic people need to start thinking about health and the financing people. So your comments Thank are perfect. You know, I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. I, I have seen the, uh, the hand from Bima. Thanks, thanks, uh, and thank you, Valerie, for that excellent presentation. It's uh, really wonderful. You know, uh, this is great. I mean, let's just say we know where the problems are. We've identified to some extent. The problem is we also need, you know, um, to have partnerships, and this particularly is political will. You know, um, and if you look at the, the countries. Uh, across Africa, the problem is that, you know, healthcare is being neglected because everything else is being the priorities. And that is why I think to some extent, you know, people are focused on small pockets of things which they can readily show uh, some type of uh, improvement in rather than on looking at the bigger picture to say, look, we must have an, a holistic approach to healthcare rather than, you know, uh, picking up on, on little pockets of things. So I think I think that is something that uh, you know the paper that uh, uh, Chan was referring to uh, actually addresses to a large extent also. See, but thank you very much. I think that's great. So uh, you know the question is how do we do this? You understand? Mm -hmm. You know we need a champion for this. You understand? I mean? Somewhere along the line there has to be, and that is you know uh, whether it comes from political leaders, religious groups, uh, you know. NGOs, whatever it is, that's that's the thing that has to drive this. We have to have drive this whole thing. See, so I don't know what's your comment on that. I think you're totally correct, and I think interestingly, the last high-level meeting on the Sustainable Development Goals was, um, I think it was 2018 or so. And at this high-level meeting, they decided that the vice presidents of countries should be responsible for the SDGs because they would they should have oversight. You know, you can't have the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Health or someone because they're all only going to think about their own silo. So I think you're exactly right. One needs political will. There's certain countries that are really committing to this. You know, I think Thailand is one, I'm not sure, I think Sri Lanka and Rwanda, for example, definitely is trying to, you know, to be quite conscious about what they're doing. You might know a lot more examples, but I think I agree with you. The, the, the political will is the key. Every country has actually signed on to these SDGs. Um, but some countries need also help. You know, some countries have very limited budgets. And so the question is, how does one help? Should, one, should the global community be helping? And this is why, again, I just am so disappointed with this vaccine idea, because it shows even when there's such an obvious target as distributing vaccines to everybody that's nobody's putting enough kind of concentrated effort to actually make it really happen then you wonder how are we going to fix the whole health system but i think if physicians like yourselves and nurses and healthcare workers at the bedside raise awareness you show the government data you say these people are suffering they have to take some kind of notice and if the data is incredible and over a long time, then it's really hard for governments to ignore. Plus, maybe trying to encourage patients to raise their own voices in patients' groups, because that's also extremely hard for governments to ignore their voters, you know? So I think the more that one disseminates this message, and I think any of you could give exactly the same talk that I've given today, 
You can download all the pictures from the internet. I'm happy to give you my talk. But the point is all of us know this stuff and I think we can all just keep repeating it and hopefully someone will listen. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Varley. Um, any other comment from the audience? So it's just that the, can you hear me now? Yeah. The, the yes. vertical programs, uh, you know, somehow uh, say may undermine the health system as, it, as compared to the horizontal approaches. Uh, how, how how does that, this impact? I, I didn't understand. I mean, I was looking through your articles. It, it's a phenomenal article and the nature review, the one in nature and, and it, it outlines everything actually. So just that little bit, I, I, I didn't understand that, how the vertical programs undermine. Okay, great. And first of all, that article was not just me. There's a lot of people who contributed. Yeah, but it's a wonderful one. Yeah, a thank vertical you. Vertical program, for example, you know, the, Gates, yeah. the, the, the Global Fund funds malaria. Yeah. So the Gates yeah. Foundation decides to set up a malaria program somewhere. They might yeah. build a nice fancy, depart, fancy building. They have yeah. a good lab. They have centrifuges, yeah. they have freezers, they have blood tubes, they have technicians, they, their machines are, you know, and then they need study nurses. So they recruit study nurses from the hospital. So often yeah. these are very dynamic, you know, eager people, maybe sometimes the best nurses, maybe even the best doctors get recruited into these studies. They get paid more. They often, you know, are then exposed to things that they may not be usually they're allowed to deliver better care in theory in this little bubble of a malaria program and so basically this particular program it's a vertical program because it's only dealing with malaria and very often for example one of the big questions is what happens if someone has malaria and diabetes and if the diabetes is totally uncontrolled what do you do you just ignore the diabetes because you're only treating the malaria you know and this happens in in quite a lot of research studies or tb outreach you know the the healthcare worker might go home to check that the patient is, is taking the tb medicine and might realize that the old grandmother in the chair is dying of something they're like i'm only dealing with tb so some so these vertical programs often drain the health system of very competent capable people plus they also create inequities they create expectations sometimes in these little perfect bubbles that cannot be met by the health system. They then feed into disappointment in the regular health system. Sometimes people feel, you know, for example, with malaria programs or even meningitis programs, people give blood. Often there's a research component. People may not want to give blood, but they know I'm gonna give blood because I can then get access to treatment for my child and this and that. So these vertical programs, can be extremely effective, but they, you know, the collateral damage that can happen in the health system has not been adequately measured. And the problem is, especially in adults, there's comorbidities. And then what happens to the comorbidities? So I think there is slowly now this idea that you have to start treating HIV, for example, in HIV, in, in your, or start treating hypertension, diabetes together with HIV. Um, you know, these are these are examples because people have realized that these horizontal is means integrated within the health system that you're actually looking at all the other problems and not only making sure you have malaria medicine in the pharmacy, but you want to make sure you've got everything else in the pharmacy as well, you know, to treat the other people. Uh, one little question more. Now, supposing you've one given your given, supposing you've given your given uh, 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 an opportunity uh, to decide on funds, what would you do in terms of priorities? Yeah, that's extremely hard. That's really, really hard. And I think there's a lot of different methods that are described. In theory, one should know the burden. One should know the burden, not only in terms of disease, but in terms of who's actually impacted, what is the financial impact and all that. And then try to understand what can I do with the amount of money that I have? You know, so these are very sophisticated, difficult, difficult to deal with um, problems. Um, health technology assessment is a new or relatively new sort of process where you really try to look at the burden from all sorts of perspectives and you also should get community feedback. The community needs to give you feedback and say this is a priority, we don't want everyone dying, so we should pay for dialysis even if that means certain people are not going to get access to, you know, their mass drug administration for leishmaniasis or whatever. So I think, unfortunately, there's always a trade-off and that should ideally be made locally, depending on the burden, the values 
of the community and making sure that there is some level of equity that I think, you know, from our perspective, in terms of dialysis, you can almost never argue that it's cost effective for a government. And so it's a very, very big problem because a lot of people are affected. You know, if it was three people, you would say, well, these three people are unlucky, but it's huge numbers. And this is where I think we need to show this, but also I feel in this case, you know, maybe try to get more money. And that's where I feel like sometimes the dialysis companies could reduce prices or we get more funding from different places, you know, so it's not only an idea of your limited budget, but maybe trying to also expand the budget somehow. So very hard. I wouldn't know what to prioritize. You know, it's a tough, tough decision. Yes. Any other, yes. Any comment, other questions? comment or questions? Um, yes, I was saying uh, thank you so much, Dr. Makwade, for introducing me. Like, but uh, also thank you so much to Valerie. Uh, for a very, very nice, pertinent and practical talk on acute kidney injury. Uh, Valerie, I'm still looking forward to meeting you. I know you and I share a lot, especially the enthusiasm also on low birth weight, uh, the Brenner theory, and the fact that we both, you and I know Bionegil Vixen. So um, the COVAX of dialysis, this is what you said if I can borrow your term, COVAX of dialysis. Yes, it is existing in Africa. I just wanted to let you know that um, in Zanzibar, uh, dialysis is free. Not only acute dialysis, but also chronic or maintenance dialysis is free. So I think uh, we have a duty to still shout and advocate to our government to make at least acute dialysis, dialysis for acute kidney injury, because it mostly affects young people in their productive years, this should be free. Government should be able to afford this. So um, I'm sure uh, there are sacrifices to be made and there are priori priorities to be made, but a uh, uh, COVAX of dialysis is happening in Zanzibar. Somehow they, can, they have been managing that for the last eight years. So I'm sure other African countries should be able to emulate and learn from Zanzibar. That is one and just a comment. But my question to you, Valerie, is now we are going to year 2025 soon, and we have this move of zero by 25. Uh, how do you think, uh, how far are we from the goal, and what lessons uh, are we going to take going forward? Because I'm almost confident that we are not going to reach uh, that target. It seems lofty enough. So what lessons have we learned? And even if we have to push it to 2030, uh, uh, what have we learned so that we can make it achievable? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pascal. And thank you as well. Great to see you because I quote your papers all the time, your fantastic work <laughs> that you've done from Norway. Um, I think your question about zero by 25 is very good. Um, I think the IS, this is, this is one of the cautions sometimes, you know, it, it sounds good to say zero by 25, and I think it's a great goal, but one also then needs to deliver on that, and I think this is also partly what, you know, a problem is with the SDGs, you can't just tell a country reduce maternal mortality or reduce NCDs, you need to make that possible and measure. Measuring AKI is very difficult, so that's one huge problem. We probably won't know if we get close. I think the issue with zero by 25, it's been a little bit of a vertical program. In some places, it has become more um, integrated. So I think that would be one big thing, is trying to integrate this acute PD into normal clinics and hospitals where it's possible. There are now the ISPD guidelines on acute PD. Brett Cullis is the uh, lead author of that. And I think those are also open access. And that just also shows how one can do PD without all the fancy things. Because I think what we need to show is that it's possible and it's not dramatically expensive. Because I agree with you that you know saving lives of AKI patients is definitely much more cost effective. The WHO is slowly starting to come around to this idea that acute PD is cost effective, um, but still they feel, um, you know, we as the kidney community haven't produced enough data. And so I think that's a huge Achilles heel. Um, I think, uh, you know, prevention of AKI also though should be a massive focus. 
which I was also trying to, to, to say today, but I, I totally agree with you that I think, um, you know, we need, to, we need to keep pushing for it, but we need then data. We need to show governments this many children or this many young people could have been saved, but we didn't have the saline or the catheter or the surgeon or the whatever, you know? So I think again, all of these goals are worthwhile, but then we need to make sure that we have the right resources to try to actually get there. And part of that is motivating for the resources, building on credible data. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. There is from the from the chat box. Can you see the question, Valerie? Or I should put it for you. Um, I see a few a few questions. Someone was asking if the WHO is helping countries to collect NCD data. And as far as I know, the WHO is actually supporting health systems development in countries because they know that this is critical. It's critical to tracking disease burdens, successes, as well as tracking a lot of other things. And there is this activity, it's called SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, which is from the health systems department or health information systems department of the WHO. And they have these uh, checklists and worksheets and things like that. So I think the WHO is definitely trying. They also do these uh, DHS surveys you know, where they try to collect data on cholesterol, hypertension, sugar, and body weight, etc. So the WHO is definitely trying to, to collect data and to help. Uh, but again, as we've seen, WHO is massively underfunded. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Valerie. So um, uh, we'll accept one more question or comment from the audience. All right. Um, I think there's no more questions, but Valerie, thank you very much. It was, this was excellent talk. And I uh, would request uh, uh, the slides for us to read and understand more about this. It's a new topic. And most of us, we don't go through this. It's something that is really exciting to read. And we appreciate that. And uh, we have come to an end uh, of our today's presentation. And uh, we'll meet next week. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, everyone who attended. But before we close, uh, Dr. Lloyd, do you have a comment? Last comment? <laughs> One Valerie? last question I missed out, Valerie. I want to ask you, for a social <laughs> risk score, uh, you said in your article, what is that about? Is it something <laughs> doable? Yeah, that, that's a paper that I actually came across in JAMA. It was more for, um, you know, it's, it's more this idea that you have a patient with kidney disease and you don't only ask, what's your blood pressure? What's your diabetes? <clears throat> but you ask, where are you living? What, what are you doing? How are you eating? Where are you getting food? What support do you have at home? You know, are you able to do a little bit of physical exercise? You know, um, are you struggling to pay your bills? You know, these kind of things, because all of these things are so relevant to an individual's health. And we so often in medicine just like get angry when someone doesn't take their pills, but we don't realize they ran out of the pills and they didn't have the bus fare to go to a pharmacy or they needed rather to buy shoes for their kid or whatever, you know, with the limited money. So I think that's more what it is, is trying to understand how to, what barriers are in this individual's life that might be preventing them help, looking after themselves because chronic patients are their own doctors. As I tell them often they're their own doctor and I'm just there to help. Um, but we want to make sure that they can, you know, and I think that's the issue. I think a lot of patients struggle with things that we don't even realize. Thank you so much. It's something like Thank you. a dialysis nurse and the total patient care that a dialysis nurse can give. The exactly. drug compliant, blood pressure control, sugar and looking into, then the complications of dialysis, the weight, the uh, nutritional advice that they can be given and, you know, looking into the family, the, the, you know, why they miss dialysis, the compliance. Exactly. That, that exactly. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. It can be applied as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It is such a wonderful okay. session. Really. Very, very uh, grateful uh, for your time and the beautiful you. session. And I think there's a lot more interaction that we can do since you're a big, uh, you know, advocate of data and so much of publication. So we would actually, uh, I mean, invite you to actually give us some idea because we are collecting a ton of data now, a very good validated data across the board on various aspects. Again, I will know. Uh, and uh, so that's something that we can interact on and, and do something. I think you guys could be leaders, you know, in that. Absolutely. I think you can, you can show people that it's possible because very often people think it's not possible and they don't even try. Whereas I think yeah. if you guys can prove that it's possible, that's fantastic because then you're taking excuses away from everybody else as well. 
So I think that's brilliant. That's brilliant. I'm happy to help, you know, in any way I can. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll be in touch with you for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.